the world has erupted in anti-racist pro protesting and because you know this isn't the first time around it seems like people are willing to go further with their demands this time we've seen that body cameras don't work we've seen that anti-bias training doesn't really work uh, Minneapolis had it all and George Floyd is dead um, and so yeah I mean the demand has become defund the police and thankfully this because of the work of so many amazing uh, activist organizations here in Austin, grassroots leadership, Austin Justice Coalition and CCU. Uh, we already have the gears in motion to do something like, or to get this process started here in, in Austin. Budget season is around the corner. Um, so we have two, or we have resolutions coming up on Thursday that will directly take a bite out of the power of the Austin Police Department. And yeah, we have David Johnson from Grassroots Leadership to uh, explain these for us. And yeah, so yeah, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. So, wow. Um, you did one, you do one, one hell of a lead in. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, I'm David Johnson from Grassroots Leadership and wonderful uh, comrades at DSA were like, hey, David, we want to talk about a couple of these resolutions that are coming up locally. And, you know, it's probably best if, if someone that doesn't look like an oppressor talks about them. <laughs> and I was like, I completely support that. I am not Barack Obama, but I approve of this message. So, <laughs> hello to everyone. And, and I'll say we'll start with what's going to be, I believe, Resolution 95. So, this one will jump out at you because it begins, whereas Black Lives Matter, now therefore. That's a real attention getter. Um, and what this resolution 95 seeks to do is to effectively end the militarization of Austin Police Department. And it reads, the council directs the city manager to ensure the city's policies and policing policies conform to the policy directives and goals of the council as stated in this resolution, with an acknowledgement that this is not an exhaustive list and will require future additions. Translated, we of the council are telling Spencer Cronk, the city manager, that uh, we need all of the policies and police and pol we need them to all follow what we're about to say. And this isn't the end of the list, we'll add stuff later. That's all that means. <laughs> and it lays out ending the use of tear gas and impact munitions, often referred to as non-lethal, or as we've seen, just less often lethal uh, rounds like bean bags and, and, and rubber bullets. It is stated, it is the stated policy of the city that the use of tear gas or impact munitions against persons exercising their First Amendment right is strictly prohibited. No more shooting less often lethal munitions at people who are peacefully protesting or protesting at all. Use of deadly force is being restricted. It says that in the state of policy at the city that use of deadly force against individuals, including persons fleeing, blah, 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 blah. Hey, the city doesn't get to kill people anymore just because it feels like it. That's what that means. That means, hey, APD will no longer be able to just use lethal force because they said, oh my God, they were coming right for me, or they had something that looked this way. It, it means, uh, or it intends to raise the accountability or, 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 or reduce, raise the accountability for oversteps of, of, of use of force and reduce the, the likelihood that they will occur. I can stand behind that not saying it's necessarily going to be as effective as we ever want it to be, but I can at least stand behind the goal. And restricts chokehold use, restricts the use of military grade equipment, res restricts the use of facial, facial recognition. I think that's great. Like, I think everything in here, like if you run through it and you're like, okay, no more use of tear gas or rubber bullets, check. Whew. Restrict the use of deadly force. People, it is sad that we live in a city where a resolution has to be offered up that names restricting the use of deadly force. What does that tell you about the community we're living in? 
where deadly force has to be named specifically as something that needs to be restricted. But it's here. And thank God it's here because as the family of Mike Ramos will tell you, it, it obviously isn't, isn't well enough interwoven into the fabric of APD's policy. Restricted use of a chokehold, amazing. Who thought of that? It's, it's like, wow, such progressive thought. Restriction on military grade equipment, restriction on facial recognition, and restriction against no knock warrants. Yo, that's 95. I can get with that. I mean, there's some things I might personally want to throw in. So, you know, I, I invite anyone who is going to sign up and testify uh, for, for the hearing on Thursday. And I know Maddie will let Maddie, by when do they have to be registered to testify? Noon tomorrow. And we're recording this on Tuesday. So that's noon on Wednesday. Jan Thank you June for, the, for the frame of reference regarding time. Yes, it is right now. Hold up a about, newspaper. Yeah, it's right now about 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, uh, June 9th. So have yourself signed up by 12 p.m. noon on Wednesday, June 10th in order to testify at the city council hearing on Thursday, June 11th. So what I just read, this one, this is uh, supposed to be resolution 95, ending the militarization of APD, about damn time. So now this is a little thicker. This is resolution 96. Resolution 96 is a little bit more comprehensive. And I think it, it works well with, it, it, it stands to work well with resolution 95. So, it is trying, resolution 96 seeks to create the mechanisms through which to reevaluate, reassess, redesign, and reallocate resources related to APD and its policies and procedures. So, quickly running through, because you know, we could read this all day, it says that it that the city manager is directed to bring forward a baseline budget that includes no additional sworn police staff positions. Because every year, APD tries to get more money, even though they have positions that they've already received, for which they've already received budget allocation, yet have yet to fill, and still they have enough people to kill people on the street. So no more of that. Eliminates the sworn positions that the APD cannot reasonably fill for fiscal year 2020 through 2021. That's what I was just speaking about. Every year, APD has reached out to city council and said, oh, we need more money, but they've secured funding for positions they have yet to fill. And every time they've screwed up, they put us in place to demand more of them before they could fill said positions. So you know what, we're demanding a lot of them now, so let's just defund all the positions that they said they need, but obviously don't, because if they really needed those unfilled positions, they wouldn't be able to function today. And whether or not they function worth the damn is up for argument, but I don't think it's a good one. So, also says that the unused funds, so the funds that will be released by cutting those positions, will be reallocated towards public health strategies, such as, but not limited to, training and standards for trauma-informed responses. It's about time that, that we start talking about trauma in a way that really requires us to, as a community, put our money behind it. You, wanna, you want to address things that we've traditionally thrown a police badge at? You want to address things that really, truly will impact what our communities look like? Then let's put that money, take that money out of cuffs, take that money out of cages, take that money out of batons and pepper sprays and tear gas and rubber bullets and put that money towards trauma-informed responses, substance use, mental health responses, a comprehensive and community-informed community policing standard, <gasps> COVID-19 relief, social services, housing stability programs. Make sure that all housing programs you pursue are not, do not exclude formerly incarcerated people. Fair chance housing is a thing. Family violence prevention and family violence sheltering strategies funded through the Austin Public Health or Neighborhood Housing and Community Development Department and other preventative actions and alternatives. But it goes on and, and it continues to speak about the need to bring harm reduction into play. It speaks about exploring options for reallocating positions and roles currently assigned to APD. So that's saying, you know, let's look at the things that we have APD doing and 
find out who else could be doing them because we need to have APD doing as little as possible, at least for now. And hell, we might find ways to have them do even less. Also, it mirrors the 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 previous um, resolution ninety five in saying no to militarized equipment, additional funding for militarized equipment. So between these two uh, resolutions, if they could get passed, we could demilitarize APD effectively and prevent it from being militarized moving into the future. Also includes funding for a process to rewrite the Austin Police Department's general orders. Now. I know there are many who are like, we don't want to rewrite Austin Police Department. We want to get rid of Austin Police Department. And you know me, I'm right or wrong. I'm, I'm riding with that. But what I will say is this, recognizing that any full defunding of APD is a future goal that will be led to by our defunding movement right now, that in the meantime, before we have fully actualized a redesign and implementation of a of a new and 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 remarkably community centered policing standard and policing structure and i don't even want to use the word policing i'm triggered by the word let's think of something different but before we get there i think it matters that we have something in place to at least rewrite their operational procedures right now because if it's going to take five to 10 years to defund APD completely, I would like for there to be something more in place to make sure they're not screwing the communities of Austin over in perpetuity until that happens. Um, funds and audit of all disciplinary records held by the Austin Police Department, along with staffing needed to build data systems designed to measure and track the, impl and track the implementation of new force guidelines and equity outcomes related to use of force. Dope. Fun, fun, there needs to be an entire uh, an entire organization funded, well-funded part of the, uh, of the city services. That's whole job is to track all of the violence that happens in the community. And police violence needs to be tracked just as, just as accurately. And I think that will, that will result in some systematic change in how police engagement is tracked, as well as how re records related to incarceration and custody are tracked at the county level. Increase the staffing for mental health first response, such as community health paramedics, to ensure the full implementation of an alternative response to 911 calls to mental health. Awesome. And that is, and I'm glad that they named that specifically because that could have easily been overlooked when referencing earlier in this, in, in this uh, earlier in this um, resolution, this resolution draft, the need to look at what positions within APD can be filled through other organizations or through other entities. Don't think we need police on every emergency call. Every emergency call is not a police is not a police action. It's not meant to be a, a point of police intervention. Funds for the distribution the distribution of naloxone and training and its use to ensure that officers save lives when confronted with drug overdose situations. I mean, they're willing to shoot us to kill us. They might as well be willing to hit us to save us includes funds for the expansion of programs to reduce or eliminate arrests for low-level nonviolent offenses by substituting alternatives to arrest and incarceration, including harm reduction strategies when the underlying issues can be better addressed with services and healthcare. So something I wanna say about that. That language is great, but be very aware that in this moment, you have a lot of false progressives who are still clinging to the concept of, of justice reform. I am not a, a reformist. Reform implies that you can't, actually it doesn't even imply. The, the, the truest, most literal definition of reform means to shape differently using the same Using this, use like taking something and shaping it differently, but using the same raw ingredients. And I don't want something shaped from the raw ingredients of APD. I don't want anything shaped from the raw ingredients of of, of Travis County District Attorney's Office. I would. I'm looking for some, and I'm not looking for for something restorative. Restorative is very limited in scope because the literal meaning of restorative 
references an impl the implied existence of a state of wellness to which one can be restored. But I would argue that no black indigenous person of color, no queer, um, non-binary, no, no woman, no individual that, that lives with anything that would be identified as a disability. No, like I could go on and on, but essentially I don't think that marginalized populations, and, and this is just me, I don't think marginalized populations have experienced wellness sufficient to be able to set as a goal restoration to that point. I think wellness for marginalized populations, and I say that inclusively, but let me say as a black formerly incarcerated man living living in, in, in active recovery from substance use disorder and mental illness. Let me talk as a black man whose first engagement with law enforcement was at the age of eight when a Chicago police officer tried to strangle me to death. Let me talk from my personal experience. From my personal experience, I have never fully known justice, so I'm tired of using the word justice because it feels like my oppressor's tools. And I don't want to see restorative justice as any, I, 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 it's not that I don't want to see, I can't see restorative justice as anything more than a cog in a greater machine of transformative justice. What we are looking at right now, this wave that we are looking at is a transformative justice wave. All of a sudden, we are talking about very transformative concepts. Defunding a police state is not restorative. That is transformative. We are watching a wave of transformative interests push across this country, and a lot of people are not ready for it because they've been stuck in, they've been stuck in reformist and, re and restorative justice mode. And that is not to take away from any of the progress that we have experienced or enjoyed as a result of the those pushing reform and and, rest, and restorative justice over the past decade. But if we are truly talking an intersectional cultural and social healing, if we are truly talking about that, then what we're talking about is not justice, it's wellness. Because our culture is sick, our people are sick, our spirits, our bodies, our souls, our minds, the way our relationships are sick. We experience illness at every level. We experience economic illness. We experience Ill educational illness. Like that's what it is. When we're, we're not seeking, I'm not seeking justice, I'm seeking wellness. So when I look at that, I, I just want to say, you know, harm reduction is a transform is part of a transformative mindset as part of a transformative modality. And so I really want to push anyone seeing this to ask for more than reform and to not settle for restorative justice. Look for something that is going to completely transform the way that we engage with one another, let alone engage with the systems that we put in place. There is no way changing the system the way that we are all looking to change them can be considered restorative. And I just want that in everyone's mind. And uh, last but not least, oh, I apologize. Last but not least, because I think the last thing that was on here that I want to say was, oh, hold on, there we go. And it says, establishes and funds an audit of the costs incurred by the city and expenditures related to suspected and or confirmed officer misconduct, including but not limited to paid administrative leave. So. That's funding a mechanism to hold uh, officers more more accountable with regard to to uh, accusations of misconduct. And I gotta say, I thought internal affairs and and like like you know we watch those movies and we watch those television shows where everybody hates internal affairs because internal affairs is policing the cops. And I can't help but wonder where the where the hell has internal affairs been while all these people in APD were killing individuals. So there we have 95 and 96 in a nutshell. 95 is like, hey, let's demilitarize the APD. 96 is like, hey, let's commit to exploring other alternatives. But I do recommend for everyone, if you are going to truly look into what this looks like or what this could look like to explore alternatives, I need you to do more than just 
call in and voice your support of, of for 95 and 96 this Thursday. And I definitely want everybody to do that. I'll do that. You know, Maddie, I know you'll do that. Most of the comrades, I know people are going to do that. That's dope. But I want to challenge everyone. So before I say it, Maddie, which ones are which ones are they are they gonna do people want to call in and sign up to talk about? Ninety-five and ninety-six. Oh, uh, and ninety-five is about demilitarizing APD, and ninety-six about is about and about time, and ninety-six is about putting things in place, putting a commitment and funding in place to explore reshaping what our what our criminal injustice system looks like in Austin. But I, I want mean. to challenge everyone to do something more than just feel good about supporting those. Because I will guarantee you that none of, I won't say none, but I will guarantee you that if everyone reads these, these resolution drafts, they will find themselves thinking, hey, that's pretty good, but man, something's missing. And what one individual says is missing will differ from what the next says. But I think it is key that everyone educate themselves. Everyone's watching the news and looking at how Minneapolis has committed to defunding their police department and disbanding it and replacing it with something else. And that sounds amazing because it is amazing. But what everyone needs to recognize is that Minneapolis, oddly enough, had already been exploring that option, had already been had already invested in researching and 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 researching different options and and developing different possibilities. They did that background work so that Fortunately, when an unfortunate event happened, they were perfectly positioned to respond in a way that to us seems very courageous in its compassion and its consideration for all of us. So please use, you know, GTS, Google that shite and, and go look up, look up the planning, the, the planning in Minneapolis for defunding the police. Search defund police plan. Google that, look it up, find out that, I know Oakland has been working on something like that for a while, because if it's something we are really pushing here, we need to look at where it's already happening and what they did to get it happening there. So 95 and 96, but just remember each of those, one's the right foot, one's the left foot, and they're both taking a first step. That's an amazing framing. <laughs> the I will definitely be uh, borrowing that, the right foot, left foot, first step. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, so yeah, I'm with DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. We believe that a world where everyone's needs are met is incompatible with a world where um, people are heavily policed and repressed by a violent and racist state. Um, Absolutely. And then of course, David Johnson is with Grassroots grassroots leadership, an amazing organization that is able to uh, have a bunch of extremely smart and dedicated people to actually like look into all of this and like push it forward, which is, yeah, definitely, you know, there's a lot of, like we were saying, uh, a lot of sad things about Austin and like sad that this is just now coming up, but at least I can be thankful to live in a city that has a David Johnson in it and a grassroots leadership in it. Very happy that we, uh, that Seneca had the idea to ask you to speak on this. Um, that was way more entertaining than I could have ever put it and way more uh, information packed. Uh, thanks for putting all the time into looking into this, all the time that you do into looking into this and pushing it forward educating people, um, amazing service you provide, David. Oh, stop. So for everybody to know, Maddie and I met canvassing. And it was the first time that I canvassed was with DSA. Hell, it was the first time I canvassed politically since moving to Austin. And she and I had never met before and had the most amazing time. And I must say, that I have, I have learned that, uh, man, DSA, diverse fam, but fam nonetheless. And uh, every time I get to do anything with any one of you, it is like an amazing and, and, and phenomenally re re rewarding experience. But 
it comes back full circle knowing that I'm getting to sit here and share a screen with Miss Maddie because we knocked on doors and had amazing experiences and and it and I will say at a time when I was feeling in some ways disheartened in organizing it was what I needed to see that that it was what I needed to see that people like the ones that are stepping up today are out there and that what they need is something to step up behind and to support. And before these recent occurrences, in recent, I mean last like six months, like let's just say before the pandemic, it was a lot, it was far more challenging to get people to see a reality outside of the singular existence they've known. This pandemic acted as a great equalizer and let an entire an entire world know that it wasn't invincible. And I think it's safe to say that we in the United States suffered most direly from a delusion of invulnerability. And so here in Austin, it's shaken people up. It's made people who never thought about, never worried about bills before wonder how they were going to pay theirs. And as a result, it has cracked wide open discussions about equity and how to address injustice and how to ensure wellness. All things that are front and center when you speak to anyone in DSA. Every one of those. And I can think of no greater political ally in this work than DSA Austin. So I thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, this, uh, thank you for all of your kind words. This has been fun. <laughs> Until next time, bye everybody. Bye. 96 yeah, and 95. Yeah, 95, 96. Write those emails, sign up to testify by noon, and uh, yeah, tune in on Thursday. It'll be historic. It will. And uh, how often do you get a chance to be a part of history? So come on with us. Every day these days, every day in 2020, but yeah. <laughs> we'll cut that part. Yeah, cut. you can cut. <laughs> Bye, Maddie. Yeah.